My name is uh, Glenn Wilkinson, and my talk today is entitled The Machines That Betrayed Their Masters. Thanks for coming along. It's a topic that I'm quite excited about, and I'll uh, yeah, like to share, share that excitement with you. At my office, I'm known as the guy with the toys, because every second day there's a parcel from eBay or Amazon or somewhere with toys in it. And I've brought a few of my toys along today, and um, as hackers, we're all a bunch of big kids, basically, so I'll play with my toys, and afterwards, if you want to play with them too, feel free to come and, uh, come and check it all out. So as I said, my name is Glenn. That's my Twitter handle if you're interested in such things. My lucky number is 11, which is why that man's wearing 11 on his shirt. I'm originally from a country called uh, Zimbabwe. It's a small landlocked country in southern Africa. I studied at the University of Oxford in England on a Rhodes Scholarship. So I have a master's degree from in computer science from there. And I currently work for an information security firm, pest, pen testing firm called SensePost. It's um, a company started in South Africa about 14 years ago. In fact, it was our 14th birthday this year. But I work for the London office, which has been running for, for a few years now. So my day job is hacking stuff. I guess I'm a security analyst or pen tester or whatever you want to call it. So I get paid to hack stuff, which is, you know, kind of a dream growing up. I never thought I'd get paid to hack into banks, and now I do, so that's pretty cool. And also spend a lot of time training, so at Black Hat Vegas, other Black Hats, Hack in the Box, all that kind of stuff. We give training on most continents. And then 20% of my time is research time, so I get to play with toys and then come and speak at conferences to uh, lovely people like you. And spoken at a few conferences over the last year um, about this tech and a few other interests that I have. But enough about me, let's talk about you. Does anybody in the audience recognize any of these addresses or uh, some of these photographs? Maybe it's uh, your house, your friend's house, a place you visited. I see we have some addresses in uh, Amsterdam, Germany, Italy, Turkey. Now, I see there are fewer people here than there were at the keynote when I collected this data yesterday, so we may not get a hit. But do let me know if you see anything of interest. Anyone from Israel? I see a nice coffee shop there that someone may have visited recently, and maybe someone stayed in the Intercontinental Hotel. And a whole bunch of us from the States. Anyone recognize their office or their house? Or someone stayed at the Essex Inn in Chicago? Well, I'm asking, but I'm actually telling. You have stayed here, you do live here, so don't worry about owning up. And of course, welcome to those of you who attended uh, Black Hat Vegas in 2012. Good to see some continuity over the years. And also uh, Black Hat EU, so welcome to those of you who have attended that conference in the past. Welcome back. And nice to see people visiting from, from all over the world. So we've got people here from the States, from all over Europe, and of course from Asia and Southeast Asia. So nice to see a, a good spread of audience. A very different picture to, of course, Black Hat Brazil, end of last year, where it seemed a lot of people were visiting from, from the region locally. Interesting. How do I know all of that? Well, the topic of the talk, something about machines, something about betrayal. And I'll give demos in a little while about how I got that information, but I got it legally above the board by passively listening to devices that you guys are carrying in your pockets. And so something about surveillance. What's interesting is that I'm doing some degree of surveillance here and profiling, but everything that I'm discussing is research done pre-Snowden. And um, a colleague, Daniel Cuthbert, and myself a couple of years ago had the idea that maybe governments and private sector organizations are spying on us and trying to figure out all kinds of information about us. And they have really deep pockets and really big budgets. And we were curious to see that if on a kind of a shoestring budget, so my, my research time, 20%, one day a week, effectively no budget, open source software, you know, cheap hardware, if we could build some degree of surveillance system to basically make some kind of large dragnet type system. So not focusing on individuals initially, but on given a large group of people, say people at a conference, people in a city, people in a country, 
could we build technology to um, surveil people on that scale? So the talk says something about machines and something about betrayal. So what are these machines and how are they betraying us? So machines relates to devices that we carry that have some kind of computing power and have some kind of wireless connection. Now you go back five years, 10 years, maybe you had a cell phone, but its only connectivity was the cell network. Go back a bit further than that, and maybe you had a wristwatch or something, and maybe the crystal emitted some tiny signal, but effectively you're isolated. But these days, more and more so, we're carrying devices that have some degree of computing power and also emit signals. Um, cell phone, maybe the most common example, a smartphone. Most of us here carry a smartphone. In fact, based on those previous images, I know that you guys carry smartphones. But that's not the only example. Um, bank cards these days have uh, NFC chips, so near field communication. Um, London, where I live, we use the Oyster card, it's a travel card. Um, also uses NFC type technology. Uh, in the States, I've noticed that your identity cards have some wireless chips inside them. Um, I see there's at least one person here wearing Google Glass. So Google Glasses, you know, the, the future's weird. Your, your, your glasses and your book and your watch, suddenly everything's got computers and wireless technology, um, which is kind of strange when you think about it. And uh, the, the thing with the Nike symbol there, that's a fitness bracelet. So that's getting really popular these days. You have this bracelet you put on your wrist and a chip you put on your shoe and a heart meter you stick on your chest and all of this stuff monitors your activity and all communicates wirelessly either to your phone or to uh, some other device for synchronization. Uh, passports these days have chips in them. Um, and it, you'll notice some of these devices essentially have short range communication, some have long range communication. But even things like NFC are sometimes not that short. On the uh, left, does anybody know what that device is? Just under the Google Glass image? Yeah, pacemaker. Wow, the future is messed up. Pacemakers have wireless technology, and not some small custom subset, actual Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, which is just really weird. So the point is that we all carry devices either on us or essentially inside us that have some computing power, and they use some kind of wireless technology. And the wireless technology that they use varies between devices. So perhaps the cell phone has um, the most number of technologies. In this image we see it has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, GSM. So a whole bunch of wireless transmitters and receivers that are essentially just shouting out information. Now the betrayal comes in when we think about what these signals are and how we can interact with them and what we can learn from them. So there's essentially two things that I'm interested in. One, the uniqueness of the signal that's being emitted by one device or a collection of devices. If a device, be it a cell phone or a passport or a fitness bracelet, if it's emitting some wireless signal that's unique, at least for some period of time, then I can uniquely identify you if I'm able to detect that signal. So the most common example and the example I have the most success with is Wi-Fi. So all of your mobile devices, if you've left your Wi-Fi on, even if you're not actively using it, as I say that, I've left my Wi-Fi on. I'm the guy giving the talk. So if you've left your Wi-Fi on, your device is constantly making noise and sending out a unique signal that includes the MAC address of the device, essentially. So I can uniquely identify this device in this room. And if I was at a conference last year and I had the same device, I could note that that device was in this room at this point in time and in that room at that point in time and at the airport at this point in time if I had the ability to detect the device at those locations. So that's the first part, a unique signature, and that's either gonna be something like the RFID signature or the MAC address or a whole bunch of other options, but generally speaking, some kind of unique signature. What we want um, after that, uh, potentially, is some way to get information about the owner of the device. And again, the way we interact with that could be a whole bunch of different options. Looking at Wi-Fi again, when um, if you've left your Wi-Fi on, your phone is constantly looking for networks that's previously connected to. And maybe there's some amount of information in there as we'll see as we go along. Uh, if it's RFID, maybe 
included in the signal is a name or a unique identifier, ID number, or, uh, or something of that nature. Um, so if you just give me a second, it seems the projector is not playing nicely with me. That's better. Okay, so yeah, as I said, the idea of a machine. <laughs> Previously it was better, wasn't it? So it doesn't like to, okay, fine, we'll just do mirrored mode. It doesn't like to do presenter mode. I'll just guess what slide's coming next. <laughs> so I think the next slide will be what, so anyway. So a machine, so the machine can be anything that's, uh, sorry? Yeah, so it's mirrored. Technology is great, isn't it? So it's mirrored. Uh, Mr. AV guy. 800 by 600, mirrored. Okay. Any 1024? Uh, sorry, 1024. Yes. Okay, we'll skip the. So the idea of a machine, a unique signature, and then a link potentially from that device to a human being. And that's what I'm interested in. So the devices that you're carrying in your pockets right now, on your wrists, can I uniquely identify you in this room? And then can I figure out who you are, where you live, who you interact with? Um, are you here with colleagues or by yourself or the spouse or something? And mobile phones, smartphones are wonderful. Like five years ago, 10 years ago, if you wanted to bug somebody or surveil somebody, you had to break into their house and install a camera in the, like the smoke detector or something and put a physical bug on the phone um, and, so, and follow them in a car. These days, we all carry the most sophisticated bugging device ever created voluntarily on our person. It's, it's bizarre. It's got GPS and camera and a plethora of wireless technologies and photographs and personal information, banking information, and we just voluntarily carry it around and uh, don't really give it a second thought. Now, as I said, there's a bunch of unique signatures. The one I'm, I've had the most success with and I'll discuss today is um, a Wi-Fi or wireless technology. And the idea is that your device has a unique MAC address. And the way the Wi-Fi protocol works, as you're sitting here, you're not connected to wireless network. Even if you're in the middle of the Sahara Desert, your device is constantly sending out a message looking for every wireless network it's ever connected to. And this stuff dates back to the Karma attack, Dino Dizovi back in 2005, but it's still completely relevant, not fixed, and in fact, more dangerous than, uh, than ever before. So your phone is sending out this message, and now I want to link that unique signature to a person. And there's two ways we can approach that, passively or actively. Now, passive linking, I don't have any interaction with your device at all. And that's what I've been doing, over, that's what I was doing yesterday to get information on you guys. So your phone is sitting in your pocket and it's looking for every network you've ever connected to. It's looking for BT Home Hub AFV1. It's looking for Starbucks. It's looking for Virgin. It's looking for, is anybody out there? So as you've traveled the globe, you've connected to different wireless networks in different countries and you've clicked join that network and you haven't, say, forget that network after you've left, your phone has remembered that and it's, in the room right now shouting out the names of all of those networks. Now immediately I can infer certain things from that. If your phone is looking for McDonald's free Wi-Fi and L Budget Airlines free Wi-Fi, then I know you're a bit of a low roller. If your phone is looking for um, the Ritz Premier Suite and looking for British Airways First Class Lounge, yeah, then I can kind of infer that you're a bit of a high roller. And sometimes the name of the network might be immediately obvious. If I see somebody looking for Royal Bank of Scotland corporate, then someone probably works at RBS. If someone's looking for Royal Bank of Scotland corporate and they're looking for Hooters, then immediately we can um, draw some conclusions. <laughs> that was an embarrassing demo I gave once. Now it's also inter interesting about the signals um, that, that are being sent out and as your phone is looking for these wireless networks is if those networks are sufficiently unique, 
then it's possible to determine the geolocation of those networks. Um, who knows what war driving is? About a, about a third of the audience. It's this technique that goes way back to 2001. And the idea is that, number one, you have to wear a ninja outfit. So there's me in the top corner there with my ninja outfit. And you have some device that has both GPS capability and Wi-Fi capability. And you basically traverse an entire city or area, and every time you see a wireless network, you note the GPS coordinates. So there I am being a ninja, wandering around London. There's only four wireless networks in London. Maybe it's a few years ago. I think there's at least five now. And every time I see a wireless network, I note the name and the GPS coordinates. And I make a table, like in the bottom corner there. And things like Starbucks, I'm likely to see thousands of times. If you take the planet, probably tens of thousands of times. But if a name is sufficiently unique, then it's, it's possible that it's only, you know, it only geolocates to one exact location. And I'm not sure about in Singapore, but at least in, uh, in the UK where I live, you have providers like British Telecom, BT, and if you get their internet at home, you get BT Home Hub dash one, two, three, four or something. So some unique name. If you're with Virgin Media, Virgin Media 61249. So the name of the provider and then um, a unique identifier. The same with businesses. So BT Business Hub and then some unique identifier. So if I can create a list like this, and then I notice that your device is looking for BT Business Hub 2DF1, and I have this big table, I can then look up the name of the network that your device in your pocket is looking for, and infer that at some point in the past, you've connected to a network in London on the corner of Old Street and uh, City Road. It's gonna take a while to do that. So luckily there's crowdsourced projects um, that anyone can be part of, and you can submit your own data. So a project dating back to 2001, Wiggle, so wiggle.net, awesome bunch of guys, and they've been uh, running the site yeah, for like 13 years now, and they have on the order of 100 million observations. And um, so I run the software, and I travel, and I just you know, collect the names of networks, GPS coordinates, submit it to them. And um, what that means is that anybody can then go and query that database and um, essentially figure out um, where devices are from. So now I see someone looking for BT Home Hub, and I immediately know that you're from this address. Now, an interesting anecdote, when I was working on the software that kind of does all of this stuff, I was sitting at a coffee shop in Oxford where I used to live, and I had my software running, and I was just watching the screen, and two guys walk into the coffee shop speaking Arabic to each other, and I was watching the screen, and I see two new mobile devices probing for a network, and my software geolocated those networks to a small town in Saudi Arabia. So I'm just sitting there watching my screen, these guys walk in, it's like, yep. I know where you're from, right down to, uh, right down to the street view of their, of their house, or at least of a place where they've lived, um, or at least visited. So passively linking the signature, and then actively linking. So now interacting with the device. So with Wi-Fi, interacting with Wi-Fi, or if it's another technology, um, sending signals to the device and interacting with it to either extract information or get it to perform some action to get more information about about the owner. Now again, this is not particularly new. This dates all the way back to 2005 and a, a, an attack called the Karma attack. But basically when your device is looking for um, Starbucks or McDonald's free Wi-Fi or something, number one, I can hear that signal. And two, I can reply and say, hey, it's me, Starbucks. Now someone was doing this yesterday in the conference, it wasn't me, but you would notice that there were access points popping up like Starbucks and like Heathrow Airport Wi-Fi, which is always a good indicator that somebody is messing with this kind of stuff, but it wasn't me. I did, yeah, I, I did try and shut down the access point. Um, but the point is that you can respond and say, hey, it's me, Starbucks, connect to me, and your device will connect, and then you'll be happily browsing, and you probably won't even notice. You'll get a little wireless symbol popping up the little Wi-Fi symbol, um, but you won't get a prompt, because you know, it's like when you go home or you walk into Starbucks, you want it to automatically and immediately connect. And by doing that, I can then intercept your traffic, and again, this is old school stuff, pull out your session cookies, look at, your brow look, look at what you're browsing, and yeah, determine who you are from your Facebook account, your Twitter account, or your email, and pull out that kind of information. Now, the Snoopy framework, is a tool that um, I worked on back in 2012, and I spoke at a conference called 44Con in London, that's DEFCON London, 
and essentially released a proof of concept Snoopy tool back then. But over the last few months, I've been working on a new version that's all uh, nicely Pythonified, and it's modular, and it's a bit more efficient. But what the Snoopy framework is, it's a distributed tracking, profiling, and data interception framework. So it takes all the ideas that we've briefly touched on, and there's nothing new about any of that that's been known for a long time, but it packages it together into a nice unified framework that you can expand on, add on. So if there's a new protocol that comes out tomorrow called Green Tooth to replace Bluetooth, then we can write a Snoopy plugin that can detect those signals and interact with those signals and populate data and manipulate data. So I said four things there. Distributed, tracking, data interception, and profiling framework. So distributed, the idea is that you can have um, these Snoopy devices running on some small, inconspicuous hardware and distribute these little Snoopy sensors over a large area, say the whole of Singapore. And you can run the Snoopy software on anything that runs essentially Linux and has the, the wireless adapters that you're interested in. So this device here is a, um, it's a Beagle Bone Black, which is sort of similar to the Raspberry Pi, so it's a single board computer. And it's got an add-on module on the top that has um, uh, 3G connectivity and a GPS device, and then a wireless antenna plugged in here. So very small, very inconspicuous. I can plug it in and leave it lying around somewhere, or put it in a nice little case. And the idea is I can leave a chair unattended, and as you're all interacting here and walking around and day in, day out, this device will be collecting information and syncing it back to a central Snoopy server. Now I can drop these devices over, say, the whole of Singapore, thousands of them. And as people move around the city, these devices will detect them, interact with them, and send the data back to a central server. So that's nice, because existing technology, things like the pineapple, you know, it runs on the single device, and then you've got to put in the memory card, take out the memory card, put it in your laptop, open up Wireshark. Um, so it's a bit cumbersome. So this is nice, because it's distributed, collects the data, sends it back to a central server. So distributed, so tracking, kind of obvious. You have this blanket of devices, and as people with wireless transmitters in their pockets walk through the environment, we note, okay, they're at this location, then this location, then this location, and it's got a GPS device, so it knows effectively exactly where it is. So distributed tracking, uh, data interception. So as mentioned, um, depending on the technology you're using, Wi-Fi, for example, or GSM, maybe we set up a femtocell, intercept your traffic, pause the traffic, and sync it back to the central server. So instead of collecting data locally, I intercept your traffic, and it goes back to the central server. So I can have 10,000 devices scattered over the whole of Singapore, and they're all intercepting traffic and sending everyone's traffic back to a central server for examination and visualization. And then profiling. So I'm not just collecting raw traffic, I'm exploring and manipulating the traffic. I can work out things like where you live, what your Facebook profile is, who your Facebook friends are, what Facebook friends you have in common, um, your inbox, who you've been emailing, common links of people you've been emailing. So those are kind of the four pieces of the tech. And essentially nothing new, but putting it all together into one unified framework. And then the next generation Snoopy, which is after the 44Con POC, there's only one image on the whole of Google Images that has Snoopy wearing a next generation Star Trek uniform. This is, if you can find another one or draw me one, please let me know. But next generation Snoopy, um, essentially all written in Python, and you have the main Snoopy process that runs, and it has a series of plugins, so be it Wi-Fi or GPS or Bluetooth or NFC, and it saves that data to a local database on the device and very customizable SQLite or MySQL or Postgres. Synchronizes that data to a central server that writes it to that database, and very modular, you can choose which plugins you want to run. And then multiple Snoopy devices all running, syncing data back to a server. And on the server you can do uh, data exploration and visualization, either in a web interface or via um, a tool called Multigo, and we'll see a demo of that in a little bit. You can also sync data over different technologies. So these little things here are called Zigbee radios. So this Snoopy drone, if I plug in the Zigbee module, it'll then collect data and synchronize it back to kind of a central Snoopy device 
um, maybe up to, up to eight kilometers away, depending on the Zigbee radio. So you can have a whole bunch of Snoopy drones with a Zigbee radio, and then one central device with a Zigbee radio, and they'll all synchronize data back to that one. And then maybe the middle one uploads data over 3G or something to some other um, central server. And Zigbee's great. So it's, this one's two and a half kilometers range. So a tiny little antenna, but two and a half kilometers, I guess, outside range. And it draws very little current, so I think 300 milliamps. And then you can create any configuration you want. So have these devices syncing over Zigbee to a device over 3G to a device over Ethernet. So basically a nice big distributed um, yeah, network to catch stuff. And here's an illustration of just um, the ability to intercept and manipulate traffic. So we have over here two Snoopy drones. Can you see my mouse cursor? You can. Two drones here and a bunch of client devices or victims. I was told I mustn't use the word victim, so a client. So devices over here that have, um, in this case, associated with Wi-Fi. And their traffic is going through the drone and then through the Snoopy server. And effectively, I do natting at the server. So I can see this client's exact IP address and traffic flowing through the server. And I just pass the traffic through uh, a proxy. And I can pull out things like cookies and websites that you're visiting, pass it through SSL strip to try and defeat SSL, which works remarkably well against most sites. Um, and then through a man in, the, man in the middle proxy setup where I can insert arbitrary code, insert arbitrary JavaScript, for example, or change every image to a picture of a cat. Or one of my favorites is turn every image upside down. So you see the guys in Starbucks you know, on their device browsing funny cats and it's upside down. So they turn it upside down. And I turn their stuff upside down. And it kind of goes on like that. You, of course, shouldn't do that. And then a um, uh, degree of traffic inspection, so pulling out things like PDF documents or VoIP conversations, and then some social media APIs. So if someone's browsing Facebook and I'm able to obtain their Facebook either session or password, I can then grab all of their friends and their friends' friends and things like that. And of course, over here, we see the, the geolocation technology using Wiggle. And of course, what's nice is these drones are fairly dumb. They don't have so much processing power. and They just pass on the grunt work to the server, potentially, which hands out internet over there. And yeah, so you can run Snoopy on a whole bunch of different technologies. So we have the uh, Nokia N900, fantastic cell phone, it runs Linux, unfortunately decommissioned, but there's a new project breathing life back into it, the Neo 900 project, kind of Kickstarter-y. Uh, I recommend you go and donate to that and get yourself a device. The Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone Black, the Shiva plug. Um, the BeagleBone Black's my favorite device. So it's stable, it can run a modern OS. So I've got Kali Linux running on here, which is great. So it's essentially a pen test box on uh, a small device like this. And yeah, if you can't see it um, over here, that's, a, that's an image of it there. And it's got this fantastic GPS and GSM uh, board on top, which is a prototype which has just been released. And what else can we do? Well, you can see I brought my uh, little friend along today. Um, so I've got my, uh, my quadcopter, and uh, this is the controller. As you can see, it's watching you guys. So this is the controller for the quadcopter. So I fly it from here. It's got a FPV camera mounted on it. Um, so essentially, I can pilot it from here. And that's all well and good, but so what? Well, so what is that? Um, I can attach one of these Snoopy devices to it and do this kind of surveillance in a mobile fashion. So attach the device to this and then fly over a large area or pursue somebody or um, any number of possible things. And because this is fairly, it's a fairly small, lightweight device. So the idea is you attach it to this and um, I'm trying to emphasize that it's not just stunt hacking. So it's kind of cool, yeah, it's a flying hacking machine but also it's kind of useful. So it's useful for a few reasons. Um, one, I can get to altitude. So I can fly this device at about 80 meters. You won't see it, you won't hear it, but with the right antenna, I'll be able to detect signals from the ground. So if there's some area where I'm not able to plug in devices locally, I can attach it to the flying machine and fly overhead at a safe altitude where you can't see me or hear me, but I can hear the signals from your device. Uh, secondly, if there's some kind of physical barrier, I can bypass that. So big walls or men with 
guns or dogs or something can bypass that physical barrier and collect data from the other side. Um, and also it's very fast. So if you want to you know, blanket a whole city very quickly, you can just do a nice grid pattern, uh, just cover the whole area collecting data from everybody down below. Now this unit's only got about 20 minutes uh, battery life, up to 40 minutes if I um, get the right kit for it. But then you can also get fixed wing devices. So fixed wing devices, you can fly for up to two hours and essentially just you know, do a grid pattern of entire city and pick up everybody from down below. And I can foresee all kinds of um, things that we could uh, play with there. So I'm just the guy who builds the tech. So I'm sure there's good uses and bad uses as with most technology. Um, as an example, say there's a riot downtown, people are looting and being very bad. Um, you could fly one of these devices over the riot area and collect all the unique signatures from the rioters below to either use in prosecution going forward or to profile and figure out who they are and where they live and that kind of thing. So maybe some degree of good, depending on who the government is. But then at the same time, maybe there's an oppressive regime and people are having a peaceful protest and the oppressive regime could fly this tech over and figure out who the protesters are downstairs, which, uh, which could be a, yeah, a bad scenario. But the idea is that it's just the technology. All technology can be used for, for good or for bad. Um, as an example, he has me flying in London. So this is a, uh, yeah, a park in London. And from this altitude, this is about 80 meters. And I'm that little tiny speck down in the kind of middle left there. So essentially, you can't see it, you can't hear it, but the device is in real time collecting data as I fly around from people down on the ground. Um, anybody recognize that? <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, that's the hotel, so that's this morning. Man, it's hot outside. I think in the future, I'll sit in my hotel room and fly via FPV from there. Um, but yeah, essentially, that's probably about 100, 120 meters, I think. And yeah, can't see it at all, but you can't get access to the pool, but you have the uh, directional antenna and a camera, and you know there's a person of interest up there. Well, you can fly up from safe distance and get a video feed and use a directional antenna to pick up devices that are of people that are on the pool. Maybe there's some kingpin up there that you want to surveil and get information on and will just identify that he's at a location at a point in time. So other things we can do with the, the aerial unit. So say we have um, John. There's John, and he's walking around with his, either his phone or his bracelet or whatever in his pocket. And we already know John's signature. So maybe he was arrested some time ago, or we've somehow identified who he is and what his signature is, his MAC address. We know what his MAC address is, his phone's in his pocket, and he's somewhere in Singapore. And we want to find John to ask him some questions. Just ask him how, how he is and that kind of thing. So what we can do, we can do a, a, a spiral search. So we can launch the UAV from some central location, it'll go to altitude and slowly circle out in a wider and wider pattern until it finds John based on his signature below. And of course you can blanket a very large area, so you can have here four drones or a hundred drones and have them deployed over a large area. Okay, we need to find person X based on their signature, push button, launch drones, and they all individually do their own circular search pattern for their grid until one of them identifies the signature that we're looking for. So here in the bottom right, that one's managed to find John. Then he calls his buddies, and he says, hey, I've I found John. And then um, we can use uh, potentially trilateration. It's like triangulation, which most people are familiar with that term, but you probably mean trilateration when you say triangulation. Um, so trilateration works on distances as opposed to angles. And the distance metric in the scenario is um, the signal strength of the device. So how many decibels the signal strength is from this device. And so the idea here is that you have one master drone, say the guy in the bottom there, and the two other drones um, are controlled by him. And they all have a GPS device. And because they know their own position and the signal strength of John's device, they can work out exactly the GPS coordinates of John. And as he moves around, the one drone at the bottom uh, relays the message to the other two to move them so we can stay in a fixed position and monitor John as he walks around. Right, enough talking. Let's have a demo. Now, the screen resolution is a little bit funny, but let's see how it works. 
All right, so you have these Snoopy drones. They're all happily running, collecting data, and sending that data back to a central server. But data is boring if it's in a text file or a database or something. So what I use is this tool called uh, Multigo. So I don't write this tool, I just use this tool. Multigo is a fantastic graphing data visualization engine, completely customizable, and it's a really lovely way to explore data. And it's made by South Africans, which um, well, from my point of view is excellent. So what I've done on the site here, I've written a few, I've created a few Snoopy entities. So you have these entities and you drop them onto the map over here. And then against entities, you can run a transform, which is just an operation. So we have this starting point, the base of operations. And I can run the transform, it says fetch drones. Now this fetches, um, you can customize what data you want to select. On the time here you have, on the side you can have uh, time metrics. So you want to fetch drones that were active today, or they were active last Tuesday, or they were active a year ago. Default is to fetch all drones that have ever been active. So this is including historical data here. So during the last year and a half, I've run all of these drones um, on my N900, on my laptop, on um, the Beagle Bone, on the Beagle Bone attached to the flying machine. And when you run it, you can specify the location that you're at. So I've been running this at security conferences for the last year and a half. And keep in mind, this is all broadcast traffic. So I haven't done anything illegal, at least in these countries. It's broadcast, unencrypted traffic that your phone is just shouting out to the world. So in Poland at CERT, 44Con, two years in a row, Black Hat Vegas, Security in Scotland, Black Hat Brazil, Black Hat Singapore, that's you guys, B-Sides, DEF CON, Black Hat EU, IT Web in South Africa, Zero Nights in uh, Moscow and Russia. So all these conferences, I've been running this. Well, let's just grab you guys. So here's Black Hat Singapore. I can run a transform fetch clients. Hey, it's you guys. Who forgot to turn their Wi-Fi off? So these are all of your devices, laptops, tablets, mobile phones. And based on the uh, MAC address of the device, because we're just looking at Wi-Fi at the stage, we can see that um, this device is a Samsung device based on the first half of the MAC address. Apple device, HTC, Apple, etc. So you can see all of you guys. Okay. Live demos are always interesting. Let's see if we can find something cool. So let's grab a subset of you guys down there. And let's just say fetch SSIDs. Now, if it comes back with no SSIDs, that just means your device was sending a broadcast message or any wireless networks out there. So little brown blips down there are the networks that these devices are looking for. So Meg, Meg, Morpheus, Logitech, don't touch. <laughs> uh, this one's pretty noisy. There's a whole bunch of devices there. Uh, blah, blah. What's interesting is when you see so this device, I guess this is us here, isn't it? Um, but when you see multiple devices looking for the same network, that's sometimes interesting. So we may or may, ne may not get a result here, but often you might see five devices looking for RBS, which is Royal Bank of Scotland. Then you know there's employees here from the Royal Bank of Scotland. Okay, so that's cool. Let's grab, so this device looks kind of noisy. Let's grab those wireless networks. And we can say fetch locations. So what that does, it queries the Wiggle website. Now Wiggle doesn't have an API, um, which means you have to do page scraping. If no results come back, that could mean that um, either they weren't in there. Let's just try. Let's grab that one. Grab a few more. So usually when you see fairly unique network names, you would expect to get a hit. Anyway, here's 
to one I prepared earlier. So here's a device, Intel device, and it's looking for ooh, Rapid7. And here we've geolocated that either to um, yeah, so the United States, I assume somewhere in Russia, and I'm not sure what that is there. So I guess Rapid7 maybe has offices in those locations. If you double-click that, then we get Street View Photograph. So maybe that's the office there. And yeah, get the address and um, yeah, link to Google Maps if you want to view it in Google Maps or something. These guys come back with anything. Yeah, so there's one good hit. So this device here, 106 whatever, so geolocated to the States. Uh, unfortunately, no Google Maps image of that place, it seems, but we get the full address. So where's this? So J. Sano Way, uh, Nevada. So someone from Nevada. Okay, so that's interesting. What else can we do? So we can potentially, if we want to see overlap between different conferences, let's grab two locations, so B-Sides London and Black Hat EU, and let's see if anybody here was at both of those events. So let's just turn up the number of results all the way up to the maximum, and we can grab both of those and say fetch clients. And there, so we see these three devices were at both of those conferences. Then we could maybe grab just those devices, copy to new graph, and then try and figure out more about just those guys. So fetch SSIDs. So some pretty noisy devices there. And then maybe we can get a hit on one of those. Okay, what else can we do? So I mentioned, I mentioned a data interception. So I can create, I can set it up to run a rogue access point and then connect to it or convince your devices to connect to it. Uh, oops, there we got a hit. So that geolocates to, actually it's not a good hit. So if we go across to this window. So this is the Snoopy software. This is running on my laptop at the moment. And I'm gonna run it. And I'm gonna say, bring up a rogue access point. And then get my phone to connect to it. Of course, it stopped working while I was talking to you guys. All right, luckily I was running it before the break. And if we look at um, which graph was it? Actually, I can do this slightly differently. Okay, so I'm gonna show you this demo. So here's a photograph. And it's a photograph of the sense post offices in South Africa. And let's pretend that um, we released this photograph. There's me and one of my colleagues. We had our hackathon this past week. So what can we do with this photograph? I can get EXIF information from the photograph. So I right click, right -click on it and say get EXIF data. And that's a you know, kind of metadata. So it could be um, location information or the type of camera used and that kind of thing. And it seems, whoops, we, actually, we accidentally or intentionally geotagged that photograph. So we know where that photograph was taken and we know it relates to SensePost. I can then, I have a transform here to query all access points that are around that location. So I've got some GPS coordinates somewhere in the world and now I'm gonna say fetch from the Wiggle database all access points that are within a 500 meter radius of, um, of that address. So this is not data I've collected, this is data in the Wiggle database. So all of these access points are around that, uh, that location. I can then go through all my historical data from all the conferences I've been to and see if I've been to any event where a device I observed at that event was looking for a wireless network within 500 meters of this address, which I suspect is the SensePost office. Alternatively, and I tested it with some other companies here, so you can find the address of Qualys, say, plug it in and check your historical data and see if anyone here is at Qualys or any prior event that I've been to. But I find it better to pick on SensePost because I don't get beaten up afterwards. So here, we see that these devices here are looking for uh, WLAN AP, not that interesting, WIFUD, maybe more interesting, Linksys, Linksys, 
So given this name is quite unique, so what that means is that these six devices here at some conference in my massive database were looking for a network within 500 meters of the SensePost office. So let's just grab those devices, copy them to a new graph, and let's um, fetch locations. What locations were these devices observed at? So they observed at B-side, Security, IT Web, so most conferences actually, so it probably is SensePost people. And then we can just check what networks they're looking for. So what networks were these guys looking for? Noisy devices, it seems, bad sense person employees. And we start to see stuff like, so I added a bit of extra data just to uh, <coughs> highlight the point. But if we see stuff like Hakito Ergo Sum, so we know it's a hacker conference, um, DEF CON, um, so because we see um, named networks that appear to be you know, security related, that's probably SensePost employees. So wh what did I do there? I know that I figured out where SensePost's offices are. So I could have entered the street address, but I had a photograph here with EXIF data, figured out the GPS coordinates of the SensePost office, then looked for all networks that are around that area within 500 meters of that office. So if you went to South Africa and went to our office, you would see these networks. And then all of those networks, I checked my historical data to see if I'd ever observed any client devices that were looking for those devices. And I found six devices looking for a network within 500 meters of the SensePost office. And then I see these devices are looking for networks like Hakito Ergosum and like DEF CON. And then for network names like this that are fairly unique, there we go, I've managed to geolocate um, this one to two possible addresses. I'm not going to double click that because it might give my address, but uh, potentially I can very quickly figure out the address of, or the home address of SensePost employees. And I tried that against a few other companies here, and it does work pretty well, but um, yeah, I don't want to get into, uh, into trouble. What else can we do? So I mentioned the rogue access point. So let's just grab these devices and copy to a new graph. And say I was running the rogue access point, I want to intercept data from, you, um, from these guys. So I intentionally did this to myself because I don't want to you know, do any data interception with you guys. And there I see this Apple device, which is my phone, was browsing these two websites whilst um, tricked into associating to my phone. So Vampire Freaks and Rubicorn Project. So I was browsing vampirefreaks.com and I can grab the cookies. So there we go. There's the uh, session cookie for um, this device that was browsing, uh, username Jimmy911. So yeah, can actively intercept data from devices. And one final demo, just to put all of that together. So what's nice with Multigo is you can run what's called a machine, which is running multiple transforms at once. So here I have base of operations, and I can do a whole bunch of transforms simultaneously. Now what this is going to do, it's going to fetch, um, fetch all active drones. It's then going to get the location of all those active drones, get all clients that were within those areas. It's then going to look for um, some commonality, so look for devices that are observed in multiple locations. So if it was observed at the airport and at Starbucks and at the hotel, grab those devices and then it's going to uh, bring up a, uh, go through historical data of a rogue access point and see if um, any data was being browsed. And then it's going to um, yeah, grab Facebook friends and um, potentially the Facebook inbox, but I won't show that. And the end result is running a bit slow, but the end result is this slide here. And so I click one button, and it does all these operations in one go, and it finds that there's a device at Heathrow Airport, Finsbury Park, Hyde Park, and Starbucks, and these devices, the BlackBerry, the Apple, and HTC, are observed at those devices, looking for these networks, the AGMC Guest and the Verizon, which were geolocated to San Francisco and the Arab Emirates. We then did data interception by bringing up a rogue access point. The guys were browsing Facebook, so we stole their Facebook um, session and managed to get a friends list and we see that those two guys, Jim Anderson and Charles Smith, have those three friends in common. 
So Multigo is really nice for exploring data. Um, here's another graph of people who have attended uh, all the conferences I've been to. So you can see all the overlap between the different cons there. So for example, that Apple device has been to 44 con and to well, both 44 cons and Black Hat 2012. Um, yeah, so it's nice for visualizing data like that. Uh, that's the demo I showed you, figuring out the sense person employees. Here's an experiment I did sitting in King's Cross train station in London for 12, well, about 12 hours. And see the graph, number of unique devices observed over time. So, um, yeah, big spike over breakfast, small spike over lunch, big spike in the evening. So just looking at a kind of macro level there. And then the ratio of devices observed. So this is from all the conferences. So 77,000 devices I've, I've observed. And a big chunk of Apple. So over three quarters Apple, and then HTC, and then Samsung, and then going down. But interesting to see how popular Apple is there. Bunch of scenarios that I can envision the stuff uh, being deployed in. So I mentioned the UAVs flying over, um, you know, maybe a riot area or something, so degree of law enforcement or bad stuff, uh, peaceful protesters. Um, another example, let's say you want to figure out the identity of a celebrity. So I noticed um, uh, Jeff Moss, founder of Black Hat, he's, he's at the back of the room. So if I know he's here and I'm running my Snoopy drone, he's playing on his phone. I know he was at another Black Hat conference, say Brazil, and I collect data from that conference. Then I know he's at some charity event, so I go to that event. And I keep going to events that I can physically know he's at, and it's like a correlation of all those different events, and he's, um, I see one device being observed at all of those different events. Then I know that that device is most likely Jeff. And then once I've identified him, then I can probably do some more active attacks to try and uh, get information off of his device. There's a lot of other scenarios where this tech is actively being used. So you may not know, but most shopping malls have the stuff running already. So in retail, for example, there's companies like Path Intelligence and Euclid Analytics, and they track your devices. They use the same tech here, so Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, all this kind of stuff. They also use cameras and audio and stuff. Uh, the military is also using it. So Nestline and Verant, they have this exact technology to do exactly what I've described here. Differences, both of these cost lots of money. Um, this stuff's open source and free and off-the-shelf hardware. Um, <laughs> I found this image, which I thought was cute, considering I'm flying drones here, the uh, Drone Survival Guide. If you're interested in how to survive drones, go to the uh, dronesurvivalguide.org. Uh, quick graph here on conferences I've attended and see number of devices I was, I've observed related to number of attendees. Uh, a metric on the end, devices per person, which is very rough. So at Black Hat, here, I've observed 398 devices of 500 attendees. So, yeah, quite a lot, but I'm sure I haven't covered all the areas. This was just running on uh, this small device yesterday for a few hours. And, yeah, I think that gives me about three minutes for questions, if I'm not mistaken. But, yeah, thank you very much for your time, and let me know if you have any questions. Uh, yes. Is there any way to get the to stop interrogating for Yep. Good question. So how can you defend yourself? So this has all been about attack. So can you stop your smartphone, at least on the Wi-Fi side, from being so noisy? Uh, no. It seems that the latest iOS, so iOS, the most recent release, it seems that they stopped it to a degree. Um, I've had various tests. Sometimes it's, so it's mostly, it's much more quiet. But Android, Windows, all the others, they're still just as noisy. So you have two options. Turn off your Wi-Fi when you're not at home, or clear your network lists. So on, on um, Apple products, there's only one option. Delete all networks. Not so convenient. But Android and Windows phones, you can selectively remove. So you should keep those, so you should ideally uh, delete those. So delete ones that are open networks, so Starbucks, that'll stop the rogue AP type attack because that only works against open networks. But then also you may not, like it's convenient when you go home to your BT Home Hub 1234 to automatically connect, but you might be shouting out your home address to the world, which at a, in a room full of hackers might not be a good idea. So it might be a good idea to name, name your home network something a little bit um, more common. The other problem, there's, there's other problems there, but that, that's a, a good idea, yeah. Have you considered uh, planting uh, SSID that allow you to track users? Planting SSIDs that allow me to track users? Um, and in, uh, 
All right. Yeah, yeah that's a good idea. So I, I could offer a, I could bring up a, a normal access point called something slightly unique, Internet 445, and if somebody voluntarily connects to it, then going forward in the future, if I see someone looking for that SSID, then I know that's a previous device I've interacted with. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's a good idea. And the nice thing with the new Snoopy framework, is very modular, so you could add that kind of functionality quite easily. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Where, where do you draw the ethical boundary? Um, so, as security researchers, I think our main role is to look for weaknesses in existing systems and shout them out to the world. And that's how the, that's how the security industry moves forward. That's why systems like SCADA are very, you know, they're so full of holes because they've been hidden from hackers. And some people, oh, you must hide it from the hackers because hackers are bad. But by not doing that, they haven't been attacked by hackers and therefore the defenders haven't had to upgrade the defenses. So what I hope to get from this project, because I'm releasing, this, I'm releasing the source code, I'm speaking at conferences, I'm saying, look at all this terrible stuff I can do, but now you're all aware of the terrible stuff I can do that other military organizations and retailers are already doing. So I'm hoping that I'm maybe on the moral high ground here because I am demonstrating how, how, how dangerous this is and now maybe Apple and Google and whatnot will say, hey, may, maybe this is a bad idea to be giving away so much information, maybe we should update our stuff. Um, so I guess I, I don't think about it too much. As a security researcher, I'm demonstrating there are weaknesses, and I hope by demonstrating those weaknesses, uh, people will make their stuff more secure. Uh, yeah. So if you physically compromise a device, can you use it to your advantage? Uh, yeah, good question. So the way it works, so there's a few configuration options. One is to use a VPN, so I bring up a VPN from this device to the server, and that's nice because then I can send all traffic, intercepted traffic through the VPN so it exits um, at one central device on the server. Um, the other option is capturing data locally, and there's a web service that synchronizes the data. Now, when you're synchronizing the data, you have the option to flush data immediately. So as soon as it's synchronized, remove it locally. But yeah, if you capture the device and physically you know, pull out the memory card, you'll either see the, um, the key for the, for the web server to, um, uh, to sync the data, or you'll get the VPN creds. But what's nice is, um, I don't have it on this one, but on the Nokia, for example, there's an accelerometer. You can get a USB accelerometer for the device. And I've got a plug in that if the accelerometer is activated in some way, destroy the device, so just flush the file system. Of course, if you're using an encrypted file system as well, then you can just maybe just shut down. But yeah, using accelerometer, you can have a self-destruct mode. I wanted to use thermite, but they said I couldn't, so I just deleted the data. Cool, any other questions? Nope. Excellent, well, thank you very much for your time.